Deichler, welcome to the podcast, my friend. Yeah, super honored to be on, man. I'm doing great things for wrestling and shout out to my uh, a mutual friend of ours, Marcus Wrestling. I know he's fan of the week a couple weeks back. He hooked us up and his son's been coming to my club. And so shout out to those guys for getting me on, man. Appreciate you having me. Uh, it's an honor, man. And yeah, shout out to the uh, to the Grind Wrestling family, man. You got the shirt on. Tell us a little bit about the club. Yeah, man. You know, it started kind of, so where I live, I live in town of St. Michael, Minnesota right now. Um, you've had Mike Thorne on the podcast. He lives like four blocks from my house. So our kids run around together and it's just, it's been an awesome wrestling town as far as just community involvement goes and from a wrestling perspective. So long story short, Dave Thorne runs a, it's called Thorne Wrestling Camps. I'm sure you guys, it, they do, a, he does an amazing job. And he's down to his camps full time. And, he, and there was just kind of a need for a club here in the town of St. Michael. And to be point blank honest, uh, I was lucky enough to get around like Brandon Paulson, and Jared Lawrence. I coached with them for a good four years or so in, uh, at Pinnacle and learned a lot. But at the end of the day, I, for whatever reason, I just couldn't get rid of this, this need to be like, hey, man, this is something I've always wanted to do. And I couldn't get rid of it. Like I've, I've been in the workforce. I was in med sales. I was like, I'm done. I, I'm never going to do the club thing. And, but it just kept coming up. And finally, I was like, if I don't do this, I'm going to regret it for the rest of my life. And here we are a year later. And we started during a pandemic and it's, it's been an absolute blast. So. And you have, uh, you forgot the other resume builder. You're the kindergarten club coach for the St. Michael's rec league. <laughs> If yeah, I'm yeah, I was mistaken. helping out with them too a little bit. Not as much this year with the club, but yeah, my little buggers are in there and you know, we've got to watch out. These little guys coming up are going to be some hammers, man. God, <laughs> dude, you would not want to be the elementary school in the town next to St. Michael with the amount of like all Americans, Olympians, just it's incredible how much wrestling's going on in St. Michael. You guys got to think it's the wrestling capital of the world. Oh, we do. So we call our neighborhood, we call it Wrestlingville because the realtors will actually, we have a guy who is kind of a special realtor, right? He's, he's helped a lot of us in town here and that's who everybody uses. And he'll, he'll drive people around and say, Hey, this is Wrestlerville. You know, there's like, I can't, I, I can't even list all my friends and fan, you know, they're like family, right? I can't even list them all because there's so many, but we're pretty lucky. I heard Kyle Kleeman talking to you and I got to repeat this story because it's so cool that you will be driving around or biking around and you'll see kids working out in their garage, like drilling. Yeah. So pandemic comes, right? And this is what, it's funny you say that with COVID and this is what makes wrestlers and wrestling great is, Hey, pandemic hits, we shut everything down, you know, on any, I'm, I'm talking middle of, let's say June, July, during the middle of the shutdowns, no joke could be a Tuesday afternoon out bike with my kids in the afternoon. It's, it's hot out you'll see garage doors open with kids. You know, I randomly one day, literally walking with all three of my kids after work and here's eight kids drilling in a garage door and I, we just stop in. Next thing you know, we're there an hour and a half and we're like, well, it's like, where are you? I was like, we, there's a wrestling practice. Sorry, you know, so we're just, <laughs> and my kids don't have shoes on and they're getting involved. So it's like, it's just an amazing, it's just fun, right? And it's one of those neighborhoods in the, you know, in today's world, it's not easy to find neighbors where kids can run the street, not look out for a car hitting them. So it's, we're pretty blessed and lucky and fortunate and having fun with it, man. That's awesome. Are you still doing the med device sales with the, the school or are you only doing the school? Nope. So I, great question. Um, I'm actually not in med device right now. So I'm doing the school full time and then nice. uh, I'm actually working for a, a contractor as well, just helping out on the side. But um, to be honest, man, it, like I said, it, it started, it all started very organically. And um, at the end of the day, like the, I'm sure as you well know, this club scene in today's wrestling world is completely different than it was 10 years ago when we were growing up. Yeah. And even like in Illinois, man, like I remember coming to overtime before Wayans at, at Midlands one year and I was walking around going, this place is unbelievable. You know what I mean? And having to scrap with guys from there. So coming from that full circle to the club scene. Now there's these, you know, obviously like Pinnacle's an amazing club and Minnesota Elite has a great club. And it was just one of those things like, Hey, there's an underserved area. If I can give and help out and serve these kids and, and to be point, you know, to be honest, I'm just trying to bring the highest energy environment and bring a passion to the sport of wrestling with these kids. And like I said, if, if that's for a season, cause a lot of kids I know go to multiple clubs nowadays. So if I can serve them, with the time that I get them 
and help them in their journey. That that's my goal. So just having fun with it, man. I love that your philosophy is one of like optimism and, and excitement in the room. And it, you know, a lot of wrestling rooms aren't like that for the kids. And so I, yeah. I noticed that was something that was important to you. Is that something yeah. your pops taught you back in the day? Great question. Yeah. My, my dad was uh, growing up, you know, it's like anything, right? Any backstory of a person it's like, Hey, I expect this or that growing up in my house growing up. It was like, Hey, win, lose, or this, I expect full effort. And, and, and just being, having, you know, attitude, right. Controlling things you can control. And I, my dad did a good job with that. And then, you know, to be honest too, getting around Brandon Paulson, he brought a sense of enthusiasm to my career that changed my life. Not even just in wrestling standpoint. Um, I'd probably say one of the biggest reasons I was able to make an Olympic team at a young age was, was due to being around Brandon and his enthusiasm. And next thing you know, you're like, Hey, if I can apply that enthusiasm and passion to my to my marriage, to my family, to my kids, you know, and, and then now, now to a club, it's like, it's been infectious and it's not easy. There's days where I'm exhausted, but I mean, anything <laughs> worthwhile is as well. I mean, you running this podcast can't be easy, man. I'm sure you're interviewing all the time and but it's early worth mornings. It. It's worth <laughs> it though. Yeah. When did you it. first meet Brandon Paulson? How old were you? Um, I was a freshman in high school. He, the first time he coached me, I was wrestling Jason Ness in the state uh, semifinals of AAA high school wrestling. And I was a freshman. He was a senior. He was number two behind Troy Nickerson that year. And I went out and took him down in like seven seconds. I was like, yes, I'm going to beat this guy. I didn't even know Jason at the time. And he ends up, a, you know, you can imagine. He, he leg slips me, gets on top, half, half Nelson, boom. I'm pinned two minutes later. You know what I mean? I'm like, I'm like what the heck? Who is this guy? So I – kind of tried to follow him and shadow him and learn from him that whole summer and spring. And he's an amazing friend. And obviously his story is special too, but long story short, Brandon was in my corner, the state semis. That's the first time I met him. I'm like, who is this guy? You know, and I had an idea. I watched him on the trials, obviously with that amazing match. But after that, the next year, he just said, Hey, if you want help, man, call me, you know, this is pre club days. And he's like, I'll help you. And I, this is back house phones. I had my mom and dad didn't give me a cell phone. I called his house phone like six times one night and he wouldn't answer. So I kept calling and finally he's like, all right, I'll answer the phone. He's like, all right, let's do it, man. Let's meet tomorrow and we'll wrestle. So that's where it started. And then from there, you guys, would you guys work out like all the time or? Like yeah, you, you know, once or twice a week he, and he would even help out the high school room. Um, I can't explain how grateful I am for just, the time he gave me on and off the mat, you know, I actually worked for his dad. So we got to know their entire family, babysat his kids. And um, he, yeah, he helped coach me and mentor me. And again, that was kind of the reason I was able to fast track, right? You go like, you know, went into cadet nationals. So the next year taking third to the next year making the junior world team and then boom, you're on the Olympic team. The only reason that was a huge part of that to be point, you know, to be frank, so. Dude, that is that run. I was just looking back at everything and the matches, and I forgot that the the scoring system was the way it was back then. And we're gonna get into all those matches, but the crazy thing to me is, in 2007. Correct me if I'm wrong. So this is your, yeah, 2007. Did you yep. get second at the junior nationals? Yeah. So yeah, I did. So I actually. You know, my, obviously, and still even nowadays, right? I wanted, to, my whole goal in wrestling at that time was to be a double junior national champion. And it still pains me, right? I mean, actually, I just learned from your last, John, hearing John Smith talk about pain of his losses and just realized, like, you can't hang on to those things, man. It's just wasted time because we're talking years of pain, right? And I didn't do it. I ended up, you know, winning Greco my junior year and taking second in freestyle to Mario, who's a good friend till this day. And um yeah but you know again from those pain but you won better. greco i thought you got second in greco i'm like how no, is it no possible? i won greco but it was okay. close it came down third period i had donnie vinson he's a tough kid you know it was a good okay. match so i thought i was gonna have to say how do you go from getting second in fargo at greco to making the olympic team the next year i was <laughs> i was having a tough one swallowing that i did take second at fila juniors which was formerly which is now uww Junior. i did take second i got tech by a guy 6060 and he crushed me and that was at the junior level so yes at, at uww juniors year before i did take second at the us wow. so so when did you so like let's say fall of 2007 are you a senior in high school at this time uh yep fall 2007 senior in high school uh training 
going to Pinnacle, kind of competitive edge back then. I was, you know, working to pay to go to a club that fall and doing some Greco stuff on the side still. Um, made a junior role team my junior of high school and got around Eric Rahalas and some of these guys and just was out the OTC all summer. And that kind of fast tracked, you know, kind of opened my world up to a whole new whole new realm of wrestling I didn't even know about. So come fall, I was like, hey, look, you know, the plan was go to Sunkiss Kids back when they had it. I went out there and took second at that. That was my first senior tournament. I lost to um, Oscar Wood in the finals and beat some David Kirby, as you all know. Yeah, he was a great friend and he was one of the nicest guys ever, right? I got to wrestle him and mm-hmm. went in the semis, and, but I had a good tournament. I was like, hey, maybe I can, you know, keep running with the senior thing for the year. So that's kind of where it started. And then did you finish out, like, were you going to school like a normal student or were you like homeschooling your final semester? Um, yeah, I, so regular student, missed about 37 days. And then long story <laughs> short, we met with the AD and we're like, look, I think I have an actual legitimate shot to make an Olympic team. Can I graduate early? And the AD at the time was like, yep. And I said, I said, all I'm going to do is train two or three times a day. I want it. I'm, my grades are good. I've been a great student. And he's like, let's do it. They signed off and the literally the state tournament, the, you know, the week later, boom, I was done and training two, three times a day. So. Man. And your pace reflects it. You put a, a pace on dudes back then. It was, it's tough to match that. What would, what, give us an example of a day in the life of your training that allowed you to have the kind of conditioning to wrestle as, as hard as you did. Yeah. You, you know, we, we had a training plan, but you know, a day in the life at that age, training for the Olympics, to be honest, like I said, I had no response. You're a kid, right? Which is nice. If you're a student athlete, you know, or even you're still a younger kid, I didn't have bills. I didn't have a house payment. I didn't have a car. I mean, it was literally just training. That, and that was my, that's singular focus. And it was a fun time in my life from the sense of, I wake up, you go every day, it's run lift, right? Or, you know, it's a practice in the morning. And then it's, um, you know, getting obviously your big wrestling workout that day. Um, and it was the typical training schedule. Where it's like, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday's off, train Thursday, Friday. And, but then every one of those days, you know, you're training in the mornings and then you're training on your off days, doing a cross training, lifting. Um, but then, you know, there was things that I would do on my own that nobody told me to do. I started at a young age. And this goes back to like, you know, the Dan Gable, what's that? What's the, the movie? that he had you know I forget what it's called but like that Dan Gable mindset just just working out all the time training you know I just saw it on my dad we, we built in the basement I trained out of my basement I made an Olympic team train out of my basement you know and lift you know doing lifts taking saunas to recover running at night just everything you name it trying to get it in so it was fun it was a fun time so what were some of the things that you would do that were just on your own like the running and just even some saunas yeah you know I a key, you know, like everything, like all these great teams and these great competitors, I believe that everybody can work hard, right? Everybody trains hard. So you're doing the hard things, you're putting in your work, doing what you got to do. But then it's also, it's the things that people don't see and the things that we don't talk about as much is recovery, right? Um, stretching. I would do hot yoga as weird as that sounds, which I didn't think, which I thought was weird until Henry Cejudo, I found out was doing it that same year and he won the Olympics that summer. <laughs> You know, so, and now AJ Ferrari out here is doing it too. So <laughs> you hear these things where it's like, I was doing hot yoga, doing stretching, doing saunas, nutrition, especially, and I'm not kidding. One of the biggest fronts that allowed me to make the jump was, I, as funny as it sounds, I have them right behind me, but it was, you know, the Olympic ideals and the mental training. This is pre-wrestling mindset, pre-podcast exposure. So there was flow a little bit and some YouTube stuff, but you know, really diving into like, Hey, if you're taking second, why, you know, why don't you believe in yourself? Or what do we got to do to, to get over that hump or get to that next level? So trying to dive in, you know, and take the time and do some uh, soul searching or whatever you want to call it was doing the work that way as well. And uh, I feel like that was something that really helps in that time as well. But, you know, even like, it's kind of funny. Yeah. So you know, Steve Frazier, I'm sure you remember that mm-hmm. name. He wrote an article in Wind Magazine back in the day. It was like seven crazy workouts, right? And just having fun with things like those crazy workouts. One of them was wrestle a two-hour grind match nonstop. So I called Jason S. on the phone. I was like, hey, let's go do this grind match, man. It was like a Friday night down at the U of University of Minnesota. We went in and wrestled freestyle for two hours straight, you know? And then one of them was like, 
go hike 24 hours out in the wilderness nonstop, you know? So when I was 16, I told, I told my dad, I was like, I'm going to do this. Right. My dad's from Northern Minnesota in a rural area. And he's like, Jake, you know, scared. I'm from the cities, right? I'm a city kid. And he's like, you're going to be so scared. I was like, I got this. I can do this. <laughs> he drops me off 10 30 at night. I only make it like 13 hours or something. I fail miserably. I've never been so scared in my life, you know, but long story short, full circle. I was just talking with Mike Thorne. I was like, dude, we got it. I ended up trying that two or three times. I never finished it. And me and Mike were like, we got to do that again this summer. Let's round up some high school kids and go do this, you know? So can, yeah. what can you bring with you to get dropped off in the woods? I think the idea was like, hey, it's just stretching your mind, right? Like, like sleep deprivation. So you can bring a backpack with water and food or whatever you need, but you just, the idea is continuous movement in the wilderness for 24 hours. And little did I know in the middle of state forest at 2 a.m. and with animals and everything else, I figured out by myself pretty quick what I, you know, I'd been, it, it just, things like that where it's like, okay, if I can do that, I, I can be, you know, I can be better here. So trying to do mental things like that was, I mean, it's just fun. It's a journey like anything else. So having fun with it too, you know? I think we just invented the Jake, the Jake Deichler summer wrestling camp. That's unique to you. The 24 hour <laughs> wrestling camp. And I know, a, I know a thousand kids that would sign up for that. We'll get right? Spartan to get involved. Cause that's Joe DeSena would love that. I think we just got something right there. I'm not kidding. You're it's, I literally just signed my wife, myself, my three kids up. We're going to do a Spartan race in New Hampshire in, uh, Heck yes. in August, man. We're flying out to my mom and dad's. We're going to do the races as a family. I I'm all about it. I love what you, you guys are one? doing. And, what? Have you done one? Uh, have you done a Spartan race before? Oh yeah. Yeah. This is like my third or fourth one. I love him, man. I love his mentality and just yeah. how tough they are. And again, it's just fun. It's fun to challenge yourself. You know, it's, it's use or lose it. And it's like, I, I don't ever, you know, it, I'm getting older, man. I got to find ways to have fun and train as you all know. It's like, yeah. let's have fun. It makes me a better coach in person. So I'm all for it, man. I love it. Man. Those are such cool stories. What about the mental side? Were you just constantly consumed with it? Like leading up to the, to the trials, you know, the, yes. the, like the yes. visualization uh, for sure, man. I, the visualization front, I think was a huge part of it in the sense of like for athletes, right? People are like, well, what is that? I think sometimes it, it's like the fear of the unknown for athletes or parents, right? Like, Hey, you know, you don't talk about it a lot, but Hey, what are you visualizing? And I think for a wrestler, what that is, is basically, Hey, when you're laying in bed the night before a big duel or a big tournament, you know, what do you, what's, what's going through your head or when you're sitting in the car driving to weigh in, what are you thinking? Or when you're at, when you're got downtime, because every athlete has downtime, it's like, how are you managing those emotions in your mind? Right. So I think, you know, and this is where being a student of the sport nowadays, these kids are so it's awesome because we got wrestling mindset. We've got you doing what you're doing with the podcast and listening to the greats talk about things where you could probably navigate that a little easier, but you know, to be honest, I think, yeah, visualization and was a big part of my journey still is in my life trying to be like, hey, let's let's see yourself winning. Let's see yourself focus on, you know, we can't always control outcomes, which everybody focuses on. Right. But it's like that Carol Dweck mindset book. Yep. You know, it's process praise. We can't always control outcome, but we can control the process. Right. So let's dive into that more. Let's you can focus on your effort, your attitude, your fight on the edge of the mat, wrestling through positions. And telling kids, hey, that's what I want you thinking about the night before. I want you seeing yourself being in a tie and pulling the trigger and scoring points and going after it. So trying to translate that, that's what's fun about coaching now is like, let's let's try to get their kids to see it from that perspective. And you tell me, it's it's like the last, it's like the unexplored frontier of wrestling. Dude, you know? it is. It, 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 and there's so much now going on, you know, with even like the, uh, the Ben Asker mental Mondays, I used to listen to those when I was getting into sales and I would be like, come on, baby. <laughs> you're like, let's go dude. It was, Cause those are like humbling moments when you're first getting into sales and you know, so yeah, but you're right. The mentality aspect is everyone, everyone I've had on pretty much has had a consistent routine of what they're visualizing and when they do it. And I mean, yeah, it is unexplored. And, and the book you mentioned is awesome. Mind Gym is another one I love. Mind Gym? Um, yeah, it's uh, easy to read. Easy to read. Definitely for the, the kids could enjoy it too. Check um, it out. Yeah, that's great. So 
you have all this kind of going into 2008 back then for the trials what was the format was it like one day tournament same day weigh in night before weigh in like how um, did yeah so you know I, I would say for better terms you know very similar to today's trials right the only difference being was the rules of Greco at that time were definitely different from a fan perspective, not fun to watch because you don't probably know what's going on. Even then, it was as an athlete sometimes you're like, what is the ball grab? And this, it was a mess. <laughs> but it doesn't, like it said, it doesn't matter, right? Within the rules, you just, as a competitor, you got to find a way and do the best you can. So it was day before weigh-ins and a one-day tournament. That was the format. So, and best two out of three matches in the finals. How brutal was the cut for you? Uh, man, I'm not going to lie. Probably the toughest thing, the toughest thing I've ever done in my life, hands down. But it's like right now walking around, I'm 202 pounds. Right. And feeling great. I can live. I can, I can do whatever I want. And you look right? great. You don't look a bit overweight. Like that's hey, great. Man. Thanks, oh. man. I tried. I mean, I'm strong because I, I eat what I want. Right. If I see a brownie on my, you know, that may, wife makes for the, I'm going to eat it if I want to. So absolutely. But, uh, no, it's with that being said that as funny as it sounds, I used to like to, as an athlete, I felt more dialed in when I was being disciplined from a weight perspective, right? Not looking as cutting weight, like, oh, I got to do this. Like rather I get to do this and be like, I knew that my best spot at making that team was being strong, was being tough, was being gritty and being disciplined. And that's the only way I was beating Harry Lester, who was the guy at the time. And so long story short, you know, I was, I wrestled 152 for high school. I was probably weighing 167 to 170 on average, uh, maybe 72. So getting down to 45, I mean, it, it, we had a very, let's put it this way. We had a plan and it wasn't easy, <laughs> but we did it, you know, and I made it. Um, that was probably the best tournament of my life was the Olympic trials and just timing. And to be honest, I give a little bit of my, you know, my faith as part of my life. I give it to that. I give yeah. it to my support system. I just, things on that day were meant to be and it worked out right for better you know maybe the next day i don't know but that day they worked out and the work came together but with that said looking back 100 percent honest i i didn't after i made the olympic team i lost i lost i lapsed in discipline for about three days two three days i didn't go to sleep for about a day and a half two days because i was so <laughs> excited i came home a day and a half after wrestling and i was 182 or 183 pounds and I wrestled 145. So I came home and right. I mean, it's like, what I'm 18 years old, you know, and, and again, there's no excuse, right? It's like this Jacko book I'm reading right now talks about, you know, extreme ownership. At the end of the day, I own the fact that I wasn't disciplined enough. I didn't keep my, I ballooned too big. And to be honest, I had to spend the next two and a half months working my way down from 182 down to 145. So come the Olympic games, I wasn't as fast. I wasn't as strong. I wasn't as explosive. I wasn't as on fire. I didn't recover as well. But again, that's on me, right? Whether I'm growing or not, that's an excuse. At the end of the day, you, you live and you learn. And I can pass that along to my athletes being like, hey, you know, during season, it's Friday night and Saturday, boys. That's when you got to be disciplined. It's after your tournament, instead of going to Applebee's and eating the full on apps, it's being disciplined now. So it just, those are lessons. So you learn. were, you were that fine tuned that even three cheat days wasn't an, wasn't permissible. That's I, crazy. I don't know, man. I just, yeah. And I probably ate everything I could have. And I was, it was hard. It was hard making it. So I just, I got huge And granted. I mean, we did, I did everything I could, man. I was, we were, the Olympic training cramp was great. Got around great athletes for the first time in my life was, um, you know, having structure, from a whole, you know, training camp. It was just cool to be part of that experience, right? Yeah. My first senior international tournament was the Olympic Games. Woo. You know, yeah. So, you know, and and like rightfully said, um, you know, it was an amazing experience. I am so grateful that everything I took from it. At the same time, yeah. I mean, I wasted a couple of years in pain of really doing some soldier and say, hey, I lapsed discipline for a little bit. It bit me in the butt. But at the end of the day, I gave everything I could, no regrets. I did every, I did the, did absolutely everything in my power to be there and give myself a shot. And it, it was, it was an amazing experience, you know, and I was angry for about three to five years, but now I look back and go, I'm thankful. I learned a lot. So three to five years. Yeah. 
I mean, it, we're talking like dreams at night, waking up the next day of seeing, you know, and we can get into this too, but after Olympic games, I, I have a history of uh, head concussion issues and head traumas as a kid. And it just, wrestling was taken away from me at a young age, younger than I wanted to. Yeah, I'd still be competing probably with Pat Smith and those guys if I could, but it's just, Dude. that wasn't the plan for my life. So. Let's hold that to the end because we are going to get to that. We got to get to the trials. Harry Lester, how dominant was he like at that le level and and how like as a young man looking up to him like how like iconic was he yeah man it i tell you what it's his time probably one of the most explosive dangerous greco wrestlers i've ever wrestled the year 2000 so that fall of 2007 like we were talking about right he had just taken a bronze medal at the world championships he happened to be in minneapolis that fall it was a random like thursday or friday it was really weird it was like random. He was just in Paulson and Dan Chan. They were like, hey, Lester's here. You want to drill with him? And I was like, yeah. The guy just took one of the best wrestlers ever. I was like, I'm in. I'll be there. We get there at 430. We have a practice. And granted, he just got done with Worlds. So he's kind of, he wasn't in that mode, right? He, he proceeded to basically do, it was like a private. Like we do privates with kids where yeah. you're teaching, coaching, training. That's basically what it was. He was showing me some cool little tricks. <laughs> kind of big brother and me beating me up a little bit you know it was I was looking up to him like hey this is Harry Lester and I'm down here you know so it was that and then fast forward to January or do you remember the Kiki Cup uh -uh. or it wasn't the Kirby Cup it, but there was something in I want to say it was Chicago it was like a duel with Bulgaria and the U.S. at the time so Harry Lester wrestles a Bulgarian guy this guy might have been number three in the world or something. He this is in January, like three, four months later. He texts him in about 30 seconds. I mean, just like boom, boom, boom. And Paulson texts him. We were both watching texting. He's like, Did you just see that? He just texted the number like three guy in the world in like 30 seconds. I was like, that was ridiculous. <laughs> I, I, I guess I had to text. And so I'm looking at this going, all right, that's who I got around. I mean, I wasn't thinking that. I'm just like, hey, I've got the US Open coming up. You know, I'm hoping to go there and be competitive. It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to beat Harry Lester. It was, so it's a journey and a process. So, Dude. It, yeah, I mean, he was amazing. He was amazing. At I learned a lot from him. So when you guys stepped on the match at the, at the trials, it was just a single match, right? Not best of three. Yep. It worked out from a seating perspective that we met in the semis. Cause I took second at the U S open to Mark Ryle. So I think I was three. And he was two and Mark Ryle was one or so. I don't remember how exactly it played out, but we were in the semis in the challenge tournament. So I only had to, you know, like I said, it played out because had I read it, wrestled him two out of three in the finals, I don't know. But that one match on that day in the semis, um, stepping on the mat, I, I was there to battle, you know, and that's, that's how it played out. So it, it worked out in my favor that day. What was the big turning point in the match for you? Like if you look back at it. If I would go back and watch a match, I mean, I've watched it a couple of times where I've done interviews or whatever. And, you know, it was before I stepping on the mat and I try to tell my athletes this, and this is what I'm trying to be better at communicating is like just competing free, right. Yeah. From a wrestler's perspective, just being free, letting it fly, you know, being in a, this state of I'm here to get after it, score points. The mantra was have fun, score points. And it was just being in the fight every second. I knew that, to be quite honest, even till this day, he was more talented. He was more explosive. He's a better competitor at that point. I knew I would have to do fight. I'd have to make him fight everything, every second of every, of the match. And if I did that, I had a gas tank. That was one of my you know strengths. And um, I ended up kind of getting him tired and I knew I'd have to explode and I give myself a chance and I end up getting him tired and uh, scoring when I needed to. And that, that was the match, man. So God, how many hours later for the finals? And then how many what? How many hours later for the finals? Oh, probably it was like two, three hours. Go back to the hotel. I'm chilling in the hotel room with my high school coach, Todd Springer. He's like, he's a Hall of Fame high school coach. He's an awesome guy. And we're hanging out. And I was like, it sounds funny. I was just like the guy that had finals, Farouk. I was like, I'm not losing this. I was like, if I do everything I'm doing, I'm this is mine. I was like, I'm not losing today. So that was kind of the mentality going back and if I knew what I need to do and did it, you know, so. Can you share the story where Farouk didn't want to work out with you because he didn't think you were up to par? Yeah, man. No, a great story. Um, I was training, you know, again, young kid. I remember I was 
my elbow was beat up. I had this nasty cauliflower ears at the time, right? It was during, it was training camp during high school season in 2000 and, 2007. So it was January 2007. So my high, junior of high school, and I went out there for my first Olympic, you know, training camp I'd ever been to. And I get down there and I'm not kidding, man. I'm beat up. I'm getting my butt kicked every practice, every day by David Kirby, by Harry Lester, by Mark Rowell, by Oscar Wood, by Kevin Bracken, by Steve Frazier. You just go down the list. I, but I kept grabbing them. And I think this is a key. Even it's fun when you see this with kids now. It's like, go grab those guys, you know? And if you can keep coming, keep getting up, keep, Farouk was one of those guys. And he, we were doing live goes on parterre and he picked me up and he must have fived me right over my head about, it must have been five, six times. And finally, he just like pushes me away. You know, and it's like, he's like, you're not even worth my time. He's like, you're a little boy. You're, you're not ready to be here. I, I'm not going with you. You know, and I remember as funny as it sounds at that point, I don't know what it was inside of me that just clicked. And it's like, oh, no. I was like, so I, I went and grabbed. I was like, we're going again. You know what I mean? And I think he continued to mess me up that practice. But at that point, it became very personal. So when I wrestled him, um, you know, and he was a great competitor. He's actually a really nice guy. Every time I was around him, he's actually a nice guy, but he kind of tried to big brother me and I just wasn't having it. So dude, that series, I watched the matches and folks, I encourage you to watch them because they are on YouTube, even though that 08 trials, you cannot find a lot of matches. Yeah. Um, it's weird. They did it with the, uh, judo that year. You never see that. That was a, an interesting, yeah. uh, trials, but dude, in match yeah. two, you lose the first period and the second period you're down five Oh, I think. And yep. you had to turn it around because back then you had to win that period. Then the next one, it's just, it's a crazy match. The way you were able to get that front headlock and just right over the top, man. Yeah. So it was a uh, called it. It's, it's essentially like a chest trap, right? Or a high reverse. We called it right. Like in freestyle guy shoots in, you go to chest trap and freestyle. It's very similar, but in that Greco and I, me and Brandon did that. And then at that Fila Junior World Team the year before, I drilled that literally thousands of times to the point where it was just muscle memory, right? So you're just instinctual as a competitor. So I was able to, I was like, if I can just get on top, you know, I can, and it just, yeah, just scrambling and wrestling. And that at the end of the day, it's so much, that's what I miss about wrestling the most is just being able to compete, be in the moment and just wrestle, just battle through those positions. That's what's so fun about it, you know? Dude, it's such an epic win. The place was going crazy. And then, like when you get to like Beijing, what was like, what's your first memories of the Olympic village? First memories, man. You know, I have looked like a tourist. I mean, we had, I probably had my little camera walking around and just, just soaking it in. It's a city, right? So obviously I wasn't eating much. Cause I was, I landed, I think I had to weigh in in like four days, five days. I was like 23 pounds over or something when I landed on the plane. Ooh. Me and Spencer Mango step on the scale and we're both like, Ooh, ooh, the country, like, oh, there we go. You know, so it was, it was, uh, it was very, 43. we were very dialed in. I mean, there was, yeah, so it was getting there and it was getting to work, right? We, uh, we practiced right below from where the NBA dream team practiced. So you go up the stairs, down the stairs, you'd see them getting off, off their bus, getting on the bus, looking up at, you know, all the guys that were on, like Kobe was on the team, right? The black, all these guys and just, seeing Rafael on the doll at launch, you know, and just all the, from the, all these faces that are big time in the sports world. You're just like, there he is eating lunch. You know, you know what I mean? And even there, they were a big deal. So yeah. it was, it was just, just an amazing experience overall. Dude. And Emotional, the opening ceremonies, I definitely say, and I'm sure you've heard this a lot, but you know, those, those opening ceremonies, very emotional, right? Very powerful. I've never felt a sense of pride and the United States or being American, you know, and at that time, probably walking out in front of the world to see, it was like, I think it was the most viewed event at the world at that time. And it was just like, this is something special. When you're part of bigger, something bigger than yourself, it was, it was a cool time to be part of that. So. And I, I can't, I mean, I can't even imagine, but I was really dying to ask you about this, not from yeah, like a demonic standpoint, but Everyone talks about in this new HBO documentary, like the post Olympic blues. Did you feel that? Like when you get back and it's quiet. Oh my God. Time? Are you talking about that? The HBO documentary? Yeah. I think it's called like the weight of gold. I literally watched that. And <laughs> it was funny. I was like, I was on HBO watching that. It was random. 
And I kept looking at my wife was like in the kit. We were at home and I kept looking. I was like, this is real. I was like, this is like every feeling here is something that, you know, but you don't get, it's like life after athletics, right? Anytime you have a huge high, you're going to come down. You're going to have a low. That is a hundred percent honest, honest truth, right? The day after I made the Olympic team and, you know, Olympic trial at home felt that way. Really? You know, after I came home, oh, hundred percent. You know, you have this huge moment, you know, the big, what seems to be the biggest moment of your life at that point, you come home and I'm sitting in my mom and dad's basement because I was still a high school kid going, all right, now what? You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, but now, so it forces you to examine, you go and it, it's much easier said than done, right? Life after athletics, right? Whether you're a division one athlete, division one, division two, II, division three, high school, maybe you're done after whatever it is, it forces you to find yourself. Who am I outside of the sport of wrestling, right? Who is, you know, where is my identity? And those are, those are deep questions that, Hey, it doesn't happen over one day, one week, one month, even a year. I mean, these, I'm still figuring that out. You know, it's probably, maybe that's why I can't leave it. You tell me, I mean, you know, those are questions that take some deep searching to figure out who you are in and outside of the sport. So but as a young man, though, you had to think there's no way I'm not wrestling in 2012 in London at that point. So you still had that Hunter. going in your mind. Yeah. And so it's still probably those um, that post Olympic blues must just be crazy. And for folks who don't know, you got to the Olympics, lost to the guy who got silver and the wrestlebacks. You lost three ball grabs in a row and the guy went on to get bronze. And that was pretty much from what I read, the story of some of those matches. So it didn't go how you wanted, but it was still the story of the Olympiad from the Greco side. And even to this day, people talk about 18 year old Jake Deitchler making the Olympic team was unbelievable. Yeah. Why did you decide not to go to UM and go to the OTC after the Olympics? It's a great question, man. I tell you what, that was interesting time. I mean, to be honest, if I had to do this all, all over again and go over and redo it, I'd probably do the same thing. And the reason I say that is, is because at the time, I'm not kidding. I just, I felt like in the Greco mode, I wanted to go win. I felt, so I lost the match in the repechage, right? The guy that you lose to, if he makes the finals, it brings you basically back into the Conci semis. So I'm in the Conci semis wrestling, the guy from Ukraine, Damian, who ended up meddling somehow like a couple years back even <laughs> this guy was a tough dude and but I at this point I was like hey I'm just lucky to be here so it battled extreme ownership at the end of the day I didn't do what it took to score points I didn't score points when I needed to and I lost ball grab or not yeah you know what I mean and that's what makes the best the best that's what makes the world champs and these medalists and it doesn't matter I didn't score and now I took I still take responsibility for that and that's what I think gets taking responsibility gets you to those places in the first place. And I didn't, but yeah, I mean, where were we at? What was the question? Yeah, again? No, I, first of all, that was fantastic, but just, I had heard before the Olympics, you had committed to the U and then oh, afterwards, yeah. and I just wasn't yeah. sure what went into that. So I'm walking out of the Olympic games or I lose that. I lose that match. I put on my backpack. I still have the back. I'm walking out of the, out of the arena. I look over the guy that I just lost to on some stupid ball grab text the guy to win a bronze medal, literally boom, boom. Within two minutes, I look over and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me right now. Had it gone that maybe it didn't go that way for me. Right. That's yeah. a realistic thing. But, and then I, I, I'm literally walked 24 feet and I get asked to do my first interview of the weekend or of the week. Right. And I'm like, I just told the guy, I was like, look, I'm sorry. Now, no, it was the first time I was ever on floor wrestling was after I saw that happen. And I was like, this is, I, I mean, I I was, I was devastated. I was like, this is not the time I'll do the interview. I, it was a bad interview, but long story short, after the Olympic games, you know, the coaches from the Olympic training center at the time, the national team approached me and said, Hey, we've never done this with anybody. Only other person that's done this is Henry Cejudo. He came here, he lived at the OTC, he traveled the world. He won Olympic gold medal. Right. Yeah. And they said, here's the deal. You can get your education. You can live at the Olympic training center full time. And you can travel the world and wrestle and try to win Olympic and world medals and make the teams. And I, for whatever reason, people are like, ah, he's caught up in the moment. But yeah, it was, but that's where my dream was. It's funny. I love 
I still to this day love NCAA wrestling more than anything in the world. And I love Olympic wrestling more than anything in the world. I believe that that's why these college and these RTCs are so awesome because it funnels into both and it plays, it helps one another feed off the other. And it's, it's great for college, great for Olympic wrestling. And they didn't have that had they, you know, I would have stayed and, but it was just, it was an opportunity and I took it. You know, I think I obviously made J Rob mad and everybody mad and friends mad, but I wouldn't take it back. And I, I went out there. I was able, I was able to travel the world, go to nine, you know, eight, nine countries that year, get experience, wrestle some of the best guys in the world. And not going to lie, after a year of it, I, you do, I learned pretty quick. I knew I said, Hey, I miss home. You know, I, it wasn't, it was, wasn't working out getting the education. Like I thought, and I said, I miss my family. And at that point I realized with sports, I was like, and life. It's like, Hey, who you're around is just as important with what you're doing. If you're surrounded by great people, you know, I, I miss that. And I was like, I need to go get back around the people that I love being around. And that's what decided to come home. And, um, yeah, that was the story of that, I guess. That you know? year must've been one of the biggest soul searching years of your life, like traveling alone all the time and just kind of experiencing the world for the first time must've been a, a crazy year. Yeah. Going from basically, it was basically a, um, a year off of school. I didn't go to school. I mean, I trained full time. I traveled the world. I was with, you know, you're living at the age of 17, 18. I was pretty much around grown men, you know, from, you know, that average age of what, 25 to, you know, Brad Varian was a really good friend and he was, I don't know how old he was. He was like a, you know, TC <laughs> Dan was old enough to be my dad and we were on the same Olympic team, right? So I'm looking up to mentors and these guys are taking me under the wing and I, like I said, I won't ever trade that time back and get to experience a world like that. Um, you know, and like I said, I'm grateful I did it because I, I didn't know what it, you don't know what your, where your journey is going to take you. I came back to the U of M and I got a concussion my first day of practice, literally first practice of college wrestling, official practice. Was that your first concussion ever? No, man. I probably, <laughs> I don't want to divulge. I mean, I've had a lot. I mean, I got my first ice race dirt bikes as a kid, played football, raced dirt bikes, wrestled. It's always been a physical, active life, you know, being, putting yourself out there. And I've had anywhere from probably 12 to 14, 15 concussions, you know, and at this point, let's say I'm at 11, 12 concussions. I get a first, I get a hit first day of practice. And to be honest, I was never the same after that. My, my career was derailed. I was never able to train the same, never able to be, you know, completely just training and being healthy. And it just, I knew it would affect, and it's still working through that, right? Still trying to, yeah. Um, but that's, that it, was my first day at the U of M. So. How would it manifest itself like, like a month later after that? Um, you know, every type of symptom that you could think of, right? I mean, really? you only get my wife. So you're a year out from being a nurse practitioner. Um, so we talk about medicine, you know, a lot of medicine talk in my house right now as we're studying, but my girlfriend's uh, a PA. So respect. Oh, there you go, man. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> yes, well, sir. Respect. That's great. It's a great industry. It seems like good at job opportunities. And, but yeah, the concussions were, you, you name it, man. Um, like headaches, like could headaches, see. fogginess, really? um, depression. And it's funny. I'm probably ADD. I for sure am. I've never taken a drug or anything for that in my entire life. And just, it was just figured out. So even through the concussion stuff, I didn't know there was haze. Like I didn't know there was things for student athletes. Like, Hey, you're struggling. I became like dyslexic and I mean, we're talking weird stuff, right? I mean, it was not good for a while. And I didn't know you could get assistance and work through that. I just, I figured it out. So I was studying. I would have to like study, take a break, study, take a break. I was doing, you know, as freshman, we had study hall, right? So I was probably studying 20, 30 hours a week just to barely pass because that's how hard, but I didn't know there was, again, I, I just took, I just, it was it's like everything else in my life. Just find a way, yeah. just fight through it, man. It, it didn't matter how you felt. So just at the time, that's what I did. Um, but yeah, it was some definitely some dark times, man, personally. And I'd, I'd say this is more so than after the Olympics of like, who are you outside of the sport of wrestling? And that's where I had to start answering those questions. And, it, and it's amazing to hear you talk about that because someone like you, as optimistic as you are, no one would ever think you ever struggled through that. So I appreciate you sharing that. When So that was your freshman year. You redshirt, uh, had, or you wrestled that year in some opens, redshirted. Then your sophomore year, 
even though you couldn't practice, dude, you had a, a, a damn good start to the season. Won the uh, the Bison Open, Russell Dake in a duel, and then you beat Alton in a duel. And when you guys beat Penn State, God, the place must have been going crazy. Oh, man. I tell you, what, not, you know, like you said, not everybody gets to end their last match of wrestling beating Penn State in Rec Hall, you know, beating. It was, it, tell you what, as funny as it sounds, I got emotional, still get emotional sometimes. It's like, I knew. So my girlfriend at the time is now my wife. We have three kids. We're married. Life is awesome. And we were dating at the time. We knew we were going to be together forever. And she was there. And I told her, she was the only person I told her. I was like, this is it. I said, this is, this is the last, because I was messed up. I mean, I was just struggling. Like I said, I was doing, it was kind of the last two rods, you will, right? I knew like, I'm going to see if I can push through. And if I can't, it's time to move on with life. And that was the last match and it was so much fun being able to compete alongside guys that I'd grown up. I mean, me and Zach Sanders and all these guys had grown up wrestling together and being able to lay it out. It was just so much fun. It was so much, still, still a great memory for sure. Dude. It, and so what, and so after that, you just, you went to Jay Rob and you said, well, I, I can't do it anymore. Or was he kind of there when encouraging? Like, how did it happen? You know, um, came home after, after, after the duel, we walked up the mat. Went to my trainer, and his name was Rich Schlofeld. He actually ended up becoming taking over high school program in Andover, Minnesota. He's a great guy. I mean, I think I spent more time with him than any coach because he was always helping me with my heads up. We traveled all over the country together, right? And I said, Rich, that's it, man. I was like, I, I, I want to be normal when I'm 40, and I'm already not normal, so I don't want to be any more off than I already am. But I was like, I said, that's it, man. It, it's time. It's time for me to move on. I, I'm so thankful for everything you've done, but I said, I just, I got it. You know, it's time. And it was, there were some hard talks behind closed doors with coaches, with trainers, and them really making sure, like, are, are you sure? You know, there's times I didn't even think about it. I was like, God, I could have just sat all year and wrestled with NCAAs and maybe tried to be a one-time All-American or whatever. Division one level. That was my dream was to wrestle with NCAAs and run out the go for tunnel. I was a kid. That was, and I never did that. But like I said, as funny as this sounds, I, I'm actually grateful it happened. I'm grateful the injuries happened. I'm grateful that I didn't get, because I wouldn't be, the, I, I wouldn't be coaching or running a club right now. I can guarantee that. You know, I find that, I'm sure with a lot of coaches, you find that, hey man, not everything went the way you want in your life, but you can't control that. At the end of the day, the only thing that helped me heal was giving back and it still does. It's, for whatever reason, it's ingrained in who I am. I don't know, but still just part of you just helping and giving back and helping kids in their journey now. That's, that's why I found coaching because after that moment, I knew that my competitive career was done. And those questions come in of who are you? What, it, what are you made of? You know, and who are you on the inside? Who are you outside of wrestling? At that point, I met my wife. Um, we, we got married, we started a family and graduated with my degree from the U of M, University of Minnesota and great friends. I still live in the neighborhood with like we talked about. And then it comes full circle, even just you know, your faith and who you are outside of wrestling. And then lastly, it was the coaching. It went into coaching. That was kind of my healing, right? Or therapy, as I call it. It's like, it's amazing. And it's so cool being able to see the next generation. And we'll see where it goes, man. Dude, so. I'm so excited that you're in coaching because like you said, a lot of times, anything you've done as an individual competitor, it's, it's more of a selfish endeavor. But you start impacting like 30, 50, 70 kids a year times 10 years that's a tremendous impact. And uh, that's obviously what, what the future is in store for you. That is a uh, man. What a story. A lot of people just don't know that. I had no idea um, yeah. the depth of all of it. And so yeah. looking forward now with your kids, how do you, and this is one of our last questions. How do you, um, how do you get them to love wrestling? Cause like, obviously your dad did that with you and you were loving working out. How do you like, what's your strategy yeah. for that? You know, Hey, I'm still learning just as much as everybody. I try tell you what, man, I love the podcast. I love listening. That's, that's the gold, right? That's where it's where you can learn from other coaches that have been through what I'm trying to go through or parents are going through with their kids. It's like, that's where I, I'm, I'm still, I'm obsessed with learning that. I love it because wrestling is so hard. It takes, it demands so much of you, but it, like I said, wrestling has changed your life because it makes you it pulls things out of you that maybe you didn't know you ever had. And it makes you a better husband, a better father, because I know what it's like to go to those places and I'm not scared to do it anymore. And you just, you almost look for those hard things. So that's what wrestling has taught me. 
and how it's impacted my life. But man, the, the things you can do, you know, from a perspective of just really, yeah, passing along those hard things, you know, and trying yeah. to help kids. And it's, it's an amazing feeling. So well, dude, it's been awesome to have you on the show. I can't wait to release it. It's today's Wednesday, May 19th, the day after Stanford's big announcement. This yeah. is going live tomorrow. Woo! Thanks for happening in the wrestling world. Jake, this has been awesome. It's very fitting with the Olympic year we're in now. Can't yeah. thank you enough for your time, brother. Thank you for all you do for wrestling and shout out to everybody in the wrestling world. Amen, baby. Thanks, Jake. Thank you.